Many of the questions that came up this morning involved issues of capacity and envisioning a new delivery system. And uh, our next uh, panel will actually focus on that. We call it, Can Health Reform Reduce Spending and Lower Recidivism in Our Nation's Jails? That's obviously an issue that's related to capacity. Our moderator for that panel, who's just coming up the stairs to my right, is, is Mady Chalk. Uh, Dr. Chalk is Director for Policy An Analysis and Research at the Treatment Research Institute. Prior to becoming a member of the staff at TRI, Dr. Clark was Director of the Division of Systems Improvement at CSAT and SAMHSA. She's provided leadership for the discretionary grant programs at CSAT in quality assurance and developments of performance measures. For 15 years before moving to the D.C. area, Dr. Chalk was a faculty member at the Yale University School of Medicine, Department of Psychiatry, and director of the Outpatient Community Services Division of the Yale Psychiatric Institute. Would you join me in welcoming Mady Chalk? Thank you. I'm really, uh, I want to thank uh, coaches for inviting me to moderate uh, this panel and uh, to participate in a discussion which I think is tremendously important <clears throat> with regard to the future of health care for offenders under health reform. Um, the Linda. The uh, Pam Rodriguez <clears throat> is the president of Treatment Alternatives for Safe Communities, TASC, in Illinois. As TASC president, she serves as liaison between TASC, large public systems, treatment and other service providers, and state and funding entities. Ms. Rodriguez was appointed in 2007 to serve as a practitioner member of the Coordinating Council on Juvenile Justice and Delinquency <clears throat> Prevention, an independent organization in the U.S. executive branch. <clears throat> She's also a member of the Oversight Board for Redeploy Illinois, which promotes local efforts to offer community-based alternatives to incarceration for juvenile offenders and has many other affiliations, including the University of Illinois at Chicago, Jane Addams Substance Abuse Research Collaboration, the Child Care Services Network, Juvenile Justice Commission of Criminal Court of Cook County, Principal Committee, and Disproportionate Minority Confinement Committee. That is a mouthful. Um, this panel and her presentation will focus on can health care reform reduce spending and lower recidivism for our nation's jails. Um, I will introduce the discussants after Pam's presentation. Please. Good afternoon. Everyone always talks about the, uh, the challenges of speaking to you all after lunch. So <laughs> as you're coming in and um, uh, can, reconvening, I hope we can um, engage you in what I think is the answer to the question, so what? Um, before I start, I want to thank the, the folks who helped write this paper. Three of them are, are here today right there, Laura Brooks, Maureen McDonald, and Daphne Bell. Um, and so they are the, the primary authors. I am the spokesperson for TASC. Um, <clears throat> ta why TASC? Why is TASC uh, here talking about this? You heard Mady describe us a little bit. I, I just want to emphasize the TASC is a statewide service organization that has bridged criminal justice and community-based substance abuse, mental health, and recovery services for 35 years. We have a proven record in the provision of comprehensive care management, ensuring access to and retention and participation in treatment and compliance with justice mandates. So balancing both the treatment side of the conversation with the uh, public safety side. So I can <clears throat> give you the short answer to the question posed to our um, 
to our group, uh, CAN, um, Substance Abuse Treatment, and uh, the ACA actually reduced recidivism and saved criminal justice and corrections costs. Yes. yes. You've heard that today. You've heard it repeatedly. That answer is yes. And so then the question becomes, what do we do now in order to prepare for that? And how do we take best advantage of that? Well, <clears throat> there are some structural problems and structural challenges in the provision of substance abuse and mental health services to jail populations. The first, and, and, the, and perhaps the, the one I want to emphasize right at the beginning and create a little clarity on, is the, is the idea of the divergent goals. We're not talking about service delivery necessarily to an incarcerated population. We are talking about people who, by and large, um, I think Dr. Vasey said this morning, the jail systems are people processors. When, um, and so the, the goal of intake in jails is really public safety and, and efficient processing of people who come in. When the, um, when I think it was 60% of the folks who come in and out of jails are there for less than a week, we're not talking about service provision. We're talking about the jails as a place for identification, potentially enrollment, et cetera. But they are not necessarily uh, a place where the most health care um, is provided. Often, though, in, in bigger communities, it is where the best health care is provided to this population who has previously been un, uninsured and, and uncovered. So when the majority um, come in and are gone within less than a week, <coughs> where the goal really there is public safety and efficient processing. What is the goal of treatment? Well, <clears throat> we all know that, too. Treatment is about recovery. It is about changing behaviors. It is about lifestyle change. That requires uh, a longer duration of care that requires all kinds of um, different wraparound services and a recovery oriented system of care. That is not what the jail system is about. So those two partners in this collaboration do have divergent goals. Additionally, um, if we're going to meet the challenge of ACA and the opportunities of ACA, we have to admit that there's insufficient community treatment resources right now to deal with the existing population, let alone a new population. If 68% of jail detainees report substance abuse or dependence and 15 to 30% of them have mental health problems and we have waiting lists in the community now for treatment, what are we going to do in order to meet the growing demand that will result from uh, coverage uh, on a whole new population? If 9 million unduplicated folks are going through the jails in a year and 10% of them have insurance, that's... 8 million who do not, who will likely be covered uh, as a result of the Medicaid expansion alone in ACA. So, and, and the, other, um, the other thing that's important to realize is that community-based treatment, uh, the population in community-based treatment is made up at least of 40% of folks who are referred by the justice system. So 40% of the people in community-based treatment are justice system involved. If and when Medicaid expansion occurs, that percentage will very likely increase significantly in community-based treatment. We already have waiting lists. We haven't even, we've talked a little bit about the challenges of providing services in rural communities. But it, we have nowhere near the capacity in urban settings, and we certainly don't have capacity in rural settings to meet the demands of an increasing uh, population. We have fragmented funding streams. Those of us who do this work, who are in this business, understand that well. Some of you may find that hard to believe or understand. We, they're disjointed, they're uncoordinated, and they're insufficient to meet the demand. So we have federal block grant funding. You heard Dr. Clark talk about that today. State general revenue funds substance abuse treatment and mental health services in communities. Medicaid, which is different than block grant and revenue. Um, county funding, counties bear a great deal of responsibility for funding corrections and community-based services in community and um, lo localities. Uh, probation fees. We have probation fees that clients pay and that are used to purchase services. Special grants, foundations. It's a very complex mix at this point in time. And that complexity creates gaps. It creates overlap. Um, and, and, and the funding streams themselves are not integrated. 
and so the services are not necessarily integrated. And there are categorical barriers between blending and braiding those services and the clients that they are intended to serve. That creates uncovered individuals, it's unfunded services, and then there's gaps in coverage and care. In the community, behavioral health care for this population can be inadequate or incomplete. Um, and there are episodes of discontinuous care, between, especially between communities and jails. Um, acute care is and stabilization is often provided in jail settings. Uh, with, but with average incarceration lasting less than one month, what happens frequently is that people participate in self-help groups. And that's the kind of care that is most available to people inside jail settings. There are some communities that have invested in therapy communities and other kind, uh, TCs within the jails, uh, but by and large, that is, that is not the norm. Care that is started in the community for this population is not continued often when they come into jails. So for example, somebody may be on methadone in the community and a few jails will continue methadone, a few jails will put people who are going through detox um, on methadone or suboxone, but that is, again, is not the norm. Detoxing in jail is far more likely um, to be the, the case. In the community, clients will get one level of care but don't always step down to the next level of care. So within communities, there is also a need for enhanced coordination and integration, not just between community-based treatment and jails, but also within the same community. We have in the substance abuse treatment field still an over-reliance on acute care. Um, we talk about chronic disease management and we're working toward a recovery-oriented system of care, but the field is not there yet. If we're going to meet the challenges and the expectations regarding outcomes and the demands of ACA, we're going to have to actually do that and not just say that that's what we intend to do. In other words, we're going to really need to transform the system, the community treatment system. The problems or the, uh, and the opportunities will not be solved by tweaks on the margins. We heard earlier this morning about building on what works, but the fact of the matter is there's a great opportunity to literally transform what is happening. Um, we need to transform with regard to assessment and diagnostic services, with regard to quality care management, and with regard to our understanding about outcomes and the way we work toward those. How are we going to do that? We have to rely on increased use of evidence-based practices. And there are lots out there. It is, I think, a misperception in fields outside of substance abuse that we do not have evidence-based practices or practices that have been proven effective in the treatment of particularly jail-involved individuals. SAMHSA, NIDA, BJA, NIC, the Gaines Center, all have a myriad of very effective proven practices that will help us achieve the outcomes that we expect with regard to public safety and recovery. We have a workforce challenge. We, and the workforce challenge is, uh, Lynetta brought it up earlier, is one that will take time to resolve. You have to have a pipeline of folks in, in training, a pipeline of folks in the educational system. Um, not everyone, I would argue, and this would be the, the, the pitch I would make at this point in time, needs to be a licensed clinical social worker, however. Again, proven practices in the field have demonstrated that peer supports and uh, people who are in recovery, former offenders, are also a very important part of a service delivery team. And so we have, um, we have the basis for that, and we know what those folks look like, but we have to make sure that eligibility um, for reimbursement includes services provided by a very broad array of, of individuals. The infrastructure demands for community treatment will be huge. You have providers that are small, that are rural, that um, have infrequent cell phone coverage and internet access, um, all the way to very sophisticated and very professional and very ready to participate in and, and lead with regard to H, uh, health information records, with regard to um, billing systems and managed care. But it's important to remember that if we're going to meet the demands and the needs of all of the communities around the country, we're going to have to help build the infrastructure uh, in ways that 
uh, will be hard will be hard to understand um, for some folks. I, as, a, as a relatively large provider, I am surprised to find out that many people still rely on paper records and are and completely, solely on paper record keeping. And so from record, electronic records to billing, et cetera, the infrastructure needs of the system are, are very significant and need to be addressed now, not in 2014. Okay. so. Whether at the state or local level, there are opportunities in healthcare reform and ACA to achieve significant savings and improve public safety by looking at the healthcare system and jails as part of the same safety net system of care. Savings realized in effective use of community-based substance abuse and mental health treatment can fund the cost of expanded health coverage and provision of substance abuse and mental health services. You heard them talking about that in Washington. It's been proven. We have the data. We know it. We just need to do it well. Jails are full of people who have provided needed and effective substance abuse and mental health treatment could significantly reduce recidivism, increase public safety, and at the same time increase recovery rates and all of the attendant benefits of that for families and communities. We have the opportunity and the incentives to plan for that expansion now, targeting high risk, high need, high impact, and high benefit populations. And those are at the county level, that the planning needs to happen at the county level, needs to happen at the state level, and the federal level. You heard Pennsylvania describe how, um, uh, how their system looks. Well, I can assure you Illinois looks nothing like that. Um, and I'll bet that Massachusetts and Wyoming and Florida look nothing like each other either. And so um, it's really important that we take this broad outline of ACA and bring it down to something meaningful at the state and local level. We have talked about justices, uh, judges convening the table and the fact that on a state level, state Medicaid, substance abuse, mental health directors all need to be there. There are justice planning bodies that need to be involved in this conversation. Um, with this, there's increased opportunities for early intervention and frequent intervention and diversion from the, the jail system. With revenue, we can afford to divert people. With community-based treatment services out there, we can afford to divert people from um, jails. It is not at all uncommon, and I would look to some of my friends who are judges in the room, for judges to say, I would definitely refer people to community services if they were there. And for state's attorneys to say, and prosecutors, there's, there's nothing in the community. They have to wait in jail four months to get services in the community. For clients to say, I'm not going to wait four months in jail. I'll take my time. I'll do my sentence, and I'll be done with it. With the expansion of resources in the community, we will have the capacity to meet that demand. And so we need to build systems and infrastructures in order to make that effective and efficient for everybody, to meet the criminal justice concerns regarding public safety and accountability, and to meet the um, client's needs for effective outcomes and to meet the community provider's needs for good communication back and forth. So there are opportunities. I like to talk about it. Some of you are familiar with ESPERT, screening, grief intervention, and referral to treatment in the healthcare system. I think the criminal justice system can integrate the same kind of strategy at every decision point along the continuum. And we don't need to talk about necessarily um, early release or programs inside jails. We can talk about strategies to link people to services in the community at any point that they come in contact with the justice system. And those are the kinds of incentives and opportunities that ACA presents. It won't be a cost to the county system anymore. It won't be a cost to the county jail. It won't be a cost to the county board. It'll be shifted to ACA and Medicaid. And that is the biggest incentive for counties uh, to invest in this work and to plan for this work. ACA will, as I have said, will propel um, community expansion, community-based treatment expansion. And um, it, is, it is our challenge and responsibility to ensure that it is well planned, that it is ready to meet the demand, that we're not waiting until 2014 to say, oh my gosh, what do you mean? You have 8 million people that you want to send to us. We know it's coming, one way or another. Um, no matter what happens with health care reform, no matter what happens with the mandate on individual coverage, no matter what happens with um, some of the other requirements that are a little controversial, the likelihood that Medicaid expansion 
to uninsured adults will happen is, I think, is ever increasing. So let's plan for it and know that it's around the corner. Um, let's see, I've got to wrap up here. So uh, I want to say something about um, the, the notion that if we just have the services there, people will come, build it and they will come. Those of us who work with this population know that is not true. Um, this is a group of people who have not had insurance coverage before. It's a group of people who have not sought preventive care. It's a group of people who have not sought routine care. They have not. Um, I don't How many of you in here are on cholesterol or high blood pressure medication and are, are um, medication compliant? Yeah. A couple. All right? Most people are not compliant with their, with their um, chronic disease management requirements. Why would this population who is so um, disabled in so many other ways be any better at it? We need to build an infrastructure that ensures that they're successful so that the investments we make in diverting them from the justice system uh, pay off and that we have, in fact, um, the benefit to community regarding increased this is not just changing the, the life and the health co uh, course for an individual. This will change whole communities. If we do this right, it will change the health status of entire communities. We have the chance to dramatically impact recidivism reduction, dramatically impact public health, and individual recovery if we build structures and improve the systems and plan for this now for what will take place in 2014. Thank you.